Hello and welcome to this channel. In this video, we will talk about pap smears, the interpretation of its results, and what happens if a patient receives an abnormal pap result. A pap smear is a cytological examination in which cells from the cervix are collected with a small brush and then examined under a microscope. Its goal is to identify precancerous cells of the cervix before they have a chance to develop into cancer. In the past, it was recommended that women get a pap smear annually. Current guidelines suggest that from the age of 21 or from the time of the first sexual intercourse on, women should have their first pap smear done. From then on, a pap smear should be done every three years at least. From the age of 30 years on, also a HPV DNA PCR test is usually done to see if a woman was infected with a strain of the human papilloma virus. The human papilloma virus is the main culprit of the development of cervical cancer and many high-risk strains have been identified. We have a separate video on cervical cancer where we also go into more detail about the different strains of HPV. There is a vaccine against the human papilloma virus. For many years it was recommended that all girls in the age group of 9 to 14 years receive the vaccine. Catch-up vaccines can also be administered up to the age of 26 years. There are three different vaccines which protect against different sets of strains. The most basic vaccine is called Cervarix. It protects against the two most high-risk strains, which are the strains 16 and 18. The second vaccine is called Gardasil, which protects against the HPV strains 6, 11, 16 and 18. The vaccine that covers the most strains is called Gardasil 9, which protects against the strains 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58. The vaccines are typically the most effective if they have been administered before any exposure to HPV. Since a few years the vaccine is also recommended for boys. HPV in boys is associated with anal and penile cancer and to vaccinate boys also helps to reduce the overall transmission of the virus in the population. How is a pap smear done? In a pap smear, first the vagina is opened carefully with a speculum. Then the doctor brushes around the exocervix and a transition zone to the endocervix with a small brush. Then the brush is wiped over the microscope slide and the cells are fixated for at least 30 minutes with a 96% alcohol solution. In the laboratory, the cells are colored with a Papa Nicolaou stain and observed with a microscope. In the microscopic analysis, we pay special attention to the size of the nuclei, the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, the number of nuclei and the presence of coelocytes. Coelocytes are specific cells that are associated with an infection with the HPV strains 1, 6, 11 and 57. What results are possible from a pap smear? The results of a pap smear are typically reported using the Bethesda system, which is a standardized classification system for interpreting and reporting pap test results. Possible results are First, the negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. This result indicates that no abnormal cells were detected. It is considered a normal or negative result, suggesting that there are no immediate signs of precancerous or cancerous changes in the cervix. Routine follow-ups as per screening guidelines are generally recommended. The second possible result is atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, and this indicates that some squamous cells appear slightly abnormal, but the changes are not clearly indicative of precancerous or cancerous conditions. The third possible result is a low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. This is typically abbreviated as LCIL, and LCIL suggests the presence of mild cellular abnormalities 
that may be consistent with a low-grade change caused by HPV infection. Another possible result is the high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. This is typically abbreviated as HCIL, and HCIL indicates more significant cellular abnormalities that are more likely to be precancerous or indicative of early-stage cervical cancer. The last possible option is a squamous cell carcinoma. This result indicates the presence of cervical cancer. In general, the percentage of abnormal pap smear results can range from around 5% to 10%. This means that approximately 90% to 95% of pap smears will show no abnormalities or will be reported as negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. The most common abnormal pap smear results are classified as atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. These abnormalities often indicate mild cellular changes that are often caused by an HPV infection. These abnormalities can resolve on their own, but they require close monitoring or may necessitate further testing or procedures. High-grade abnormalities, such as high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion or carcinoma, are less common but indicate more significant cellular changes that may be precancerous or indicative of cervical cancer. These abnormalities typically require additional diagnostic procedures, such as a colposcopy and potential biopsy, for further evaluation and treatment planning. What happens if a patient receives an abnormal pap result? If a patient receives the information that a pap smear resulted in atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, we usually want to repeat the pap smear in around 6 to 12 months. We can also make a HPV DNA PCR test. Here usually another swab of the cervix is made, which is then examined by a polymerase chain reaction test to detect the presence of HPV DNA and to identify which strain is present. If a patient receives the information that a pup resulted in a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, we also usually recommend to redo a pap smear in 6 to 12 months. Additionally, we can recommend to do a colposcopy within 3 to 6 months. A colposcopy is a procedure used to closely examine the cervix, vagina and vulva with a microscope. Iodine and vinegar are two substances that can be used during a colposcopy to enhance the visualization and highlight abnormal areas on the cervix. This help helps to guide the doctor from which areas biopsies should be taken. Iodine reacts with the glycogen in the cervical cells causing normal cells to turn brown. Areas that are lacking glycogen, such as abnormal or dysplastic cells, do not react and remain unstained, so they will appear white. Acetic acid, a diluted vinegar solution, is another commonly used substance during a colposcopy. When applied to the cervix, it causes the surface of abnormal cells to turn white. This change in color can help to highlight the areas of potential dysplasia or abnormality. So to recap, iodine and vinegar will turn abnormal cells white and the doctor can then take biopsies from those areas. Typically several biopsies are taken from different areas of the cervix. If a patient receives the information that a pup resulted in a high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, a colposcopy is also recommended, but at an earlier time than for a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, typically within a few weeks. If a patient receives the information that a pap smear resulted in a squamous cell carcinoma, it necessitates immediate medical attention and further diagnostic procedures, such as additional biopsies and imaging tests, to determine the extent and stage of the cancer for appropriate treatment planning. If a biopsy of the cervix was done, the patient usually receives a grading by the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia scale. This scale goes from CIN1 to CIN3. 
CIN1 essentially means that one third of the cells of the sample of the cervix is occupied by dysplastic cells. It is graded as a mild dysplasia. In CIN2, around two thirds of the cells are occupied. It is graded as a moderate dysplasia. And in CIN3, all the cells in this sample are occupied. It is graded as a severe dysplasia or carcinoma in C2. If a patient has a cervical dysplasia, the biopsy and pap smear are usually repeated in certain intervals of 3 to 12 months. If a CIN1 persists for 2 years, a CIN2 persists for 1 year, or if a CIN3 is found, a conization is usually recommended. In many cases, the cervical dysplasia will also resolve by itself, especially in younger women. Studies suggest that approximately 60 to 70 percent of CIN1 cases may regress spontaneously within two years, especially in younger women. The regression rate for CIN2 is lower compared to CIN1. It is estimated that around 30 to 50 percent of CIN2 cases may regress spontaneously, while the remaining cases may persist or progress to CIN3 or higher. CIN3 is less likely to resolve on its own compared to CIN1 or CIN2. Only a small proportion of CIN3 cases, approximately 10 to 30 percent, may regress spontaneously, while the majority require further intervention or treatment. Which factors promote the persistent or progression of a cervical dysplasia? A persistent infection with high risk strains of HPV, particularly HPV type 16 and 18, is the primary risk factor for the development of cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer. HPV is mainly transmitted through sexual contact. A weakened immune system can make it more difficult for the body to clear HPV infections and control the progression of cervical dysplasia. Factors that can weaken the immune system include immunosuppressive medication, certain medical conditions such as for example HIV or AIDS, and organ transplantation. Smoking tobacco is associated with an increased risk of developing cervical dysplasia. Chemicals present in tobacco smoke can affect the cervix making it more susceptible to HPV infection and the development of abnormal cellular changes. Some studies have also suggested a possible association between long-term use of oral contraceptives and a slightly increased risk of cervical dysplasia. Also having multiple sexual partners or engaging in sexual activity at an early age increases the risk of HPV infection and the development of cervical dysplasia. Not undergoing regular cervical screening, such as pap smears or HPV testing, can delay the detection and treatment of cervical dysplasia, allowing it to persist or progress. Some STIs, such as chlamydia or herpes, can increase the risk of developing cervical dysplasia. Also, hormonal changes, such as those occurring during pregnancy, may affect the growth and progression of cervical dysplasia. How is cervical dysplasia treated? The treatment of choice for a severe or persistent cervical dysplasia is the surgical conization, also known as a cone biopsy. During this procedure, a cone-shaped section of abnormal tissue from the cervix is removed. A conization can be performed under general anesthesia or local anesthesia. The surgeon uses a scalpel, laser, or a heated wire loop to remove the abnormal tissue from the cervix. The depth and extent of tissue removal depend on the extent of the abnormality. In some cases, the surgeon may need to close the wound with stitches to promote healing. A conization is usually performed on an outpatient basis, meaning that the patient can go home the same day. The recovery time varies, but most women can resume their normal activities within a few days to a week. It's common to have some vaginal bleeding or discharge for a few weeks following the procedure. Patients are usually advised to avoid sexual activity and tampon use for a few weeks or until the cervix has healed. 
What are some potential risks and complications of a conization? As with any surgical procedure, there is a risk of bleeding and infection. In rare cases, conization can cause narrowing or scarring of the cervix, so cervical stenosis, which may require further treatment or intervention. In some instances, a conization can slightly increase the risk of preterm labor or delivery in a future pregnancy. In very rare cases, a conization can increase the risk of cervical incompetence, which is when the cervix weakens and opens prematurely during pregnancy. That's it for this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you for watching and hopefully see you again in the next video.